Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. Amen. Let's pray, please. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this, your holy word. Thank you for the hope that you've given to us. Let us, Lord, now us accept this message and may it, Lord, uh, touch our hearts. And may it be from you and your good and perfect will, giving you all the glory and honor. For it is in your name, Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Hope. That is our hope. Romans 5 really begins another transition point in Paul's writings in the book of Romans. Paul has set out God's way of, of justifying sinners and establishing it, and he's basing it on the Old Testament precedent, on the Old Testament. He, he used the Old Testament to show his point and to prove his point to the Jewish people and to us, to our hearts. He used the Old Testament. Now, Paul now turns his attention to some of the more uh, marvelous, more of the good, I think, consequences of justification by faith. People who were formerly in a state of rebellion against God, we are moved from that rebellion into a good standing with God. And I, I'm glad, because without that, we have no hope, right? But see, they have a right standing, we have a right standing by transferring our trust to the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, and his resurrection was justified us. Hallelujah. Now, this relationship is really one of peace with God. And not only peace with God, but access to God. We can actually go to God, and we can talk to him, and he hears us. And if one has this relationship, then by God's grace, we can mature in that relationship. And we can mature in the love of God through the Holy Spirit and all the circumstances of our lives. Brothers and sisters, people who are Christians don't sit still in our faith. We mature. If we're genuine Christians, we, we, we get better. We get stronger. If we're a serving, active Christian, then we should be wanting to mature and grow in our faith. So we first we have the new relationship. In verse 1, this is a, is a sort of a situation, sort of desperate, for repentant sinners are, transfer, are, are transformed, changed, through justification by faith, and to one that's a, our situation changes into a peace with God. It says, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, justification is gained by faith. In the Lord's death, his substitutionary death, and his bodily resurrection. Hallelujah. We have faith in that. We believe it happened. We believe it because it's in God's word. And Jesus' uh, resurrection proves the sufficiency of his blood atonement. Because he was resurrected, that proves that God accepted his sacrifice. If one has been justified by faith, then we have, if, if you have not been justified by faith, then you don't have peace with God. But if you do have it, and you do believe it, you do have the faith, then you do have peace with God. Faith in Jesus Christ makes things possible it makes a relationship with God possible. Hallelujah. But it's only through our faith in believing in Jesus, what he did for us, and that he's alive today. Hallelujah. That's the only way we can have a relationship with God. Before a person is justified by faith, we are sort of enemies of God. We're rebellious. 
were sinners, unworthy to even talk to God. Their hostility may be expressed in apathy to God's purpose, or it may take the form of being hard-hearted in the midst of religion, just like uh, was the case with the Jews when Jesus was there. And it was, seems like the ones who were called the religious, they were the ones that were most against Jesus, weren't they? Well, that's part of the way it is for those who don't accept by faith Jesus Christ. In this context, the meaning of peace is reconciliation with God. Peace with God comes when a person's pride yields to a, a very grateful appreciation of God being gracious to us, and he makes us right before him. Hallelujah. In other words, we know that we're made right before God because he himself made us right. Hallelujah. We didn't make ourselves right, did we? We can't. I have peace with God because I trust him. He made me right. If I made me right, hmm, I'd be worried about that. <laughs> but if God made me right, who? hallelujah, who, who better to make me right before God than God, right? Well, that's, this whole, that's the point here. The point is God made us right. So because of that, then we're right with him. And this brings about a removal of, of wrath. We don't have to worry about God's wrath and divine wrath because we are in God's favor now. Now this new relationship, though, involves more than an inner feeling of peace. It's a changing of our status before God from wrath to peace. Hallelujah. From being unworthy to being worthy. And God made us that way. Feelings of peace are derived from this change status, but feelings, our feelings do not give us peace. We may have feelings of peace, but that's not what we're talking about here. Immature Christians sometimes tend to go from emotional very highs to emotional very lows. And even some of us who are mature, we all suffer these same highs and lows, don't we, in our spirituality? But as we mature in our spirituality, the highs are just as high, but the lows are not as low. We go up and down in our faith, don't we? And we go high, hallelujah. And we go low sometimes. But as we mature, the lows aren't so bad anymore. But we, I think we will always have them all our lives until we see him face to face. Hallelujah. We need to realize that our feelings, though, even when we're in these lows, our feelings at any given time have no effect whatsoever on the death of Jesus Christ, the fact that he's already died for our sins. We may be feeling low. That's our weakness, right? We may be feeling not as spiritual as we want to be, and we struggle with it. And sometimes we just, oh, we just, oh, it's hard, isn't it? But that doesn't change anything. Jesus has still done what he did. Our salvation does not depend on our feelings. He has died for our sins. He has saved us. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter how we feel. Our salvation is based on his work, what he has done for us, and the fact that it has happened. Hallelujah. Do you know real peace? That's the question. Only through a trustful commitment to Jesus Christ can we really experience peace with God. Open your heart to faith to the Prince of Peace. He's called the Prince of Peace, but he didn't bring peace on the earth. He brought peace to us between us and him. We need to invite him to come into our lives and take control of it. Then underneath all life's troubles and agitations, we can still know the peace of God. Peace floods the soul when Jesus rules the heart. Another benefit of being justified or saved is access to God and his grace revealed in verse 2 says, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Now, the word access here denotes 
an introduction into the presence of an exalted person. It's like access to the king, uh, access to the president. If we wanted to see the president, we just say, hey, I'm coming up there tomorrow. I'll see you later. And we drive up there and voila, we go right into his office. No problem. Not that we want to, but we could if we have that kind of access. That's what this word means. That we have that kind of access. That he gives it to us. We just walk in. We don't have to make an appointment. We just come in. Christ is the one who ushers us into God's grace. We don't have to make an appointment. We have it. We have access to God's grace. Jesus opens the doors to us to the presence of the sovereign God. And when we go into his presence, you know what we find? We find grace. We find grace. It is by grace in which we stand. That's exactly what he says. Because we can't stand before God any other way. We have access and we can go in and we can stand there in the presence of God because of his grace. The believer is firmly and immovably established by God's grace. Since grace is the arena in which we stand, we should enjoy the privilege of that grace. We have access to God. Our former rebellions, our former uh, sins have not merely been forgiven, but we're not even receiving the punishment of it. It didn't happen. It's by God's grace. We're brought into a position of high favor with God. Hallelujah. You know, when he looks at us, he sees his son. What did we do to deserve that? Nothing. And yet we stand before God as his child. Understanding. The future hope Christians have allows us to take courage, I think, even in the afflictions of life, even in the problems and troubles the misunderstandings. Humans can be pretty terrible to each other sometimes. And the troubles and the trials come. Even people who love each other, we get angry and do things we shouldn't do. Say things we shouldn't say. But we still have that hope, even as Christians. We should take courage to go through those troubles and those afflictions of life. Verse 3 says, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that sufferings produce perseverance. I remember one time I was praying specifically about this passage. And I was trying to think of it, and I was, I was, oh, I was so honest with God. I told the Lord, Lord, I don't want any perseverance because I don't want to suffer. I don't want trials. I don't want tribulations. And if all you're going to produce in me is perseverance, then take away the perseverance because I don't want to suffer. I don't want the trouble. But then I realized something. That doesn't make sense. If I'm going to live, if I'm going to be here on this earth, I've got to have perseverance. And the way to have perseverance and grow in perseverance is to have troubles and trials. And then my perseverance grows. Hallelujah. And Paul here, he continues. He continues with this chain links of progress in the Christian life. How it gets how it changes and, and, uh, and grows. Needless to say, rejoicing in our sufferings is not very normal with Christians. We don't, why not? Well, because, you know, because we don't want to glory in our tribulations. Because I don't want to glory in the hope of God because I don't want to have trouble. I don't want to have trials. 
We do not have the sanctifying desire sometimes to see Jesus face to face because we know we got to go through trials and tribulations to get there. It's one thing to submit to. It's another thing to endure tribulations without complaint. But it's another thing to actually glorify in trouble. To glory in trouble. To glory in the midst of situations that are not good. Those that learn to glory in Christ appearing then can learn to exalt God in their afflictions and troubles and trials. This is something that as we mature in Christians, that's what we learn to do. But it's not something that an easy or an immature Christian can do. And that's why we see many people, when they go through trials, when they go through tribulations, when things are not going good, the first thing that goes out the window is their faith in God. Their faith in Jesus. I understand that. Because sometimes I'm tempted to be the same way. Tribulation literally means pressure. It describes distress that's brought upon us by circumstances outside of ourselves, like difficulties and sorrow and persecution, unpopularity, illness, loneliness. The list goes on and on forever. But let us remind ourselves that in the New Testament, affliction is viewed as a normal experience for Christians. Let me say that one more time. In the New Testament, in the writings, in the gospel, even Jesus, that is normal for Christians to go through trouble and trials and tribulations. That is normal. I don't like it. My sinful nature says, I don't want to do this. But it's necessary for Christians who want to learn perseverance. The reason Paul could be so positive about sufferings is because of what sufferings produce. Do everybody understand? God can turn experiences of suffering into times of spiritual growth. Christians don't glory in suffering for the suffering's sake. No. Sufferings are the means of spiritual growth. We don't like to suffer, but we understand what suffering does for us. It makes us stronger. Spiritual growth of our sanctification makes us more useful to God Almighty. As we grow in strength and spirit, then we are actually better tools for God to use to help others. Sometimes, we can help others and understand their pain and understand their agony because we've gone through the same thing. It's hard for me to tell you I understand. When you come to me with a problem, you come to me with something that's really bad and I look at you and I say, I understand. Do I really understand? Not unless I've had the same problem. Right? I don't want the problem, but I've, how can I say I understand if I've not had the problem? So that's why sometimes sufferings, we have to have them, brothers and sisters, so that God can use us better. Because we understand then. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. I don't like to suffer, but if that's how I can be better used by God, then so be it. The word perseverance literally means to remain under. It is a staying power. It's the capacity of staying under a heavy burden or a heavy load. The concept is not one of just passively waiting for it to get over, but it gives us an attitude of overcoming in other words, we're not just saying, oh, 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 we're saying, this is going to be good. I'm going to make it. There's two different 
attitude, you know. And when we go that way, then we develop character, Christian character. Charles Spurgeon said it this way. He says, the Lord gets his best soldiers out of the highlands of affliction. He allows us to go through the test of suffering and trial so that we may be fashioned into instruments of strength. There's no easy way, no easy method to grow spiritually mature. I wish there was. And if I find it, I won't keep it a secret. I'll tell you guys. Believe me. But there's no easy way. Strong Christian character comes from perseverance learned in the fire of tribulation. But our Heavenly Father only allows what we can endure. That's the good part. Don't worry. God's not going to let you burn up. He might let you hurt for a while. And you may get some stinging and burning, but he's not going to kill you. But if he does, hallelujah, you're going to be in his presence immediately anyway, right? <laughs> so, wow, think about that for a minute, right? But he only gives us what we can endure. I look at it this way. If God's letting me have trouble and trials and tribulations, Either he's going to give me just enough to where he can use me, or he's going to give me so much he's going to take me home. Either way is wonderful. Hallelujah. Right? There's no easy way. But our Heavenly Father, he wants us to become useful instruments of praise and glory in his hand. And after we have persevered and, and tested, we attain a proven character. Verse 4 says perseverance and character and character hope. The word character indicates a tested value. It describes an approved, a quality product. It means uh, it's a use of metals where impurities have been purged by fire. That's how it used to be used, becoming pure metal. The endurance of trials tends to burn the dross of our lives out. It reduces our want list dramatically. If I go back years ago, what I wanted from God was a lot. Today, I just want a couple things from the Lord. And I don't think it's age. I think it's spiritually maturity. See, I think this endurance here, it makes us men and women of approved or tested character. And this proven character is of great worth because of what it produces. And hope is the diploma award. Hallelujah. It's the award, our hope. We, by the grace of God, we do well in the test of character. By the grace of God. Two people can meet the same situation one, situ one person by that same situation can drive them to despair. The other person, they come out on the other end triumphant with victory. But it's the same situation. How come? Because some people grow and some people are defeated. I want us to grow. To one, it can be the end of hope, and to the other, it can be a challenge to great. I do not like crises, but I do like the opportunities they provide. There is hope in God, and it's only there. Throughout the Old Testament, there's a forward look. Even in the darkest hours, the light of hope shines brightly because of what God had promised that he would accomplish through men. This hope is the experience of what God can do or whether what God does do for us. For the justified amid the tribulations of this life, we are redeemed, hallelujah. And it ain't because of us, it's because of God. His grace. Hope is found in living a life by trusting in the promises of God. Remember, never be discouraged. Never lose hope. For tomorrow will be a better day. And you know why I know tomorrow will be a better day? Because God is in it. 
God's in it. And if I can't feel him right now, it's because of my weakness, because God is still right here. So there should be no shame. Next we learn that this developed hope does not disappoint us because it opens the door of the love of God. It says, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Hallelujah. The Christian's hope does not disappoint us. It will never prove to be just an illusion. Uh, it's, but all the hope in the world is an illusion. If we hope in anything in the world, we know it's an illusion because it's temporary. Hope is based on eternal promises of God, and we know that God is always faithful, so if He makes us a promise, it will be fulfilled. The present work of the Spirit is a pledge that hope in which believers glorify. Hallelujah. The ground of our assurance is not the strength of our purpose, not the strength of our faith, it's con not the confidence in our goodness, but it is in the love of God. That is why we have assurance that God will keep His promises because He loves us. It's a love, there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Our hope is firmly anchored on God's redeeming love. He showed us by giving us his son. God loves us with an everlasting love backed by an everlasting power. And this precious love of God is not just given out to us a little bit by a little bit. But he gives us just continuous love. The Holy Spirit is pouring out and streams upon the hearts of the redeemed. God's love is freely abundantly and lavishly given to us. God's love for us is not just an external thing or simply an intellectual stimulation. God's poured out his love into our hearts, into the very inner part of us. It's a wellspring of our life. God's love. Hallelujah. So in conclusion... I want to ask you, are you experienced the outpouring of the love of God by the Holy Spirit? If you're not, you can. First, we have to exalt in the glory of the return of Jesus Christ. We know that Jesus is coming back. Hallelujah. And that should lead us to exalting and glorifying in our tribulations. When they come, don't worry. God's going to help you and use you. Third, exalting in tribulation leads to overcoming our circumstances, which is God is using to purify us and make us better character. He uses that. And that way, he can make me a better tool, an instrument for him. Then you'll have the hope unsinkable and full of glory that hope that only God can give to us hope is the flag that's held high over the heart where Jesus is enthroned we have you know how you know that Jesus lives in me because I have hope hallelujah Jesus is my hope it's like having a little flag saying hope hope right here we have hope what's the meaning of my hope it's based on Jesus Christ God loves us. He loves you. He loves me. He's poured his love in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Trouble in this world we will have. It's unavoidable. We're always going to have trouble. We're always going to go through trials and tribulations. Sooner or later, every one of us is going to have adversity in our lives. The question is, how are we going to handle it? How are we going to use it? We can use it to grow. Or we can be defeated by it. Every moment of difficulty, every minute of problems can be a lesson if we will let God work in our hearts. Let's pray. Lord, this is hard for me to say